Section two of Tales of the Fish Patrol by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section two The King of the Greeks. Big Alec had never been captured by the Fish Patrol. It was his boast that no man could take him alive, and it was his history that of the many men who had tried to take him dead, none had succeeded. It was also history that at least two patrolmen who had tried to take him dead had died themselves. Further, no man violated the fish laws more systematically and deliberately than Big Alec. He was called Big Alec because of his gigantic stature. His height was six feet three inches, and he was correspondingly broad-shouldered and deep-chested. He was splendidly muscled and hard as steel, and there were innumerable stories in circulation among the fisherfolk concerning his prodigious strength. He was as bold and dominant of spirit as he was strong of body, and because of this he was widely known by another name, that of the King of the Greeks. The fishing population was largely composed of Greeks, and they looked up to him and obeyed him as their chief and as their chief he fought their fights for them, saw that they were protected, saved them from the law when they fell into its clutches, and made them stand by one another and himself in time of trouble. In the old days the fish patrol had attempted his capture many disastrous times and had finally given it over, so that when the word was out that he was coming to Benicia, I was most anxious to see him. But I did not have to hunt him up. In his usual bold way, the first thing he did on arriving was to hunt us up. Charlie Legrand and I, at the time, were under a patrolman named Carmentel, and the three of us were on the reindeer, preparing for a trip, when Big Alec stepped aboard. Carmentel evidently knew him, for they shook hands in recognition. Big Alec took no notice of Charlie or me. "'I've come down to fish sturgeon a couple of months,' he said to Carmentel. His eyes flashed with challenge as he spoke, and we noticed the patrolman's eyes drop before him. "'That's all right, Alec,' Carmentel said in a low voice. "'I'll not bother you. Come on into the cabin, and we'll talk things over,' he added. When they had gone inside and shut the doors after them, Charlie winked with slow deliberation at me. But I was only a youngster, and new to men and the ways of some men, so I did not understand. Nor did Charlie explain, though I felt there was something wrong about the business. Leaving them to their conference, at Charlie's suggestion, we boarded our skiff and pulled over to the old steamboat wharf, where Big Alec's Ark was laying. An Ark is a houseboat of small, though comfortable, dimensions, and is as necessary to the upper bay fishermen as are nets and boats. We were both curious to see Big Alec's Ark, for history said that it had been the scene of more than one pitched battle, and that it was riddled with bullet holes. We found the holes, stopped with wooden plugs and painted over, but there were not so many as I had expected. Charlie noted my look of disappointment and laughed, and then to comfort me he gave an authentic account of one expedition which had descended upon Big Alec's floating home to capture him, alive preferably, dead if necessary. At the end of half a day's fighting the patrolmen had drawn off in wrecked boats with one of their number killed and three wounded, and when they returned next morning with reinforcements they found only the mooring stakes of Big Alec's Ark. The ark itself remained hidden for months in the fastnesses of the Suisun Tulis. "'But why was he not hanged for murder?' I demanded. "'Surely the United States is powerful enough to bring such a man to justice.' "'He gave himself up and stood trial,' Charlie answered. "'It cost him fifty thousand dollars to win the case, which he did on technicalities with the aid of the best lawyers in the state. Every Greek fisherman on the river contributed to the sum.' Big Alec levied and collected the tax for all the world like a king. The United States may be all-powerful, my lad, but the fact remains that Big Alec is a king inside the United States with a country and subjects all his own. Well, what are you going to do about his fishing for sturgeon? He's bound to fish with a Chinese line. Charlie shrugged his shoulders. We'll see what we will see, he said enigmatically. 
now a chinese line is a cunning device invented by the people whose name it bears by a simple system of floats weights and anchors thousands of hooks each on a separate leader are suspended at a distance of from six inches to a foot above the bottom the remarkable thing about such a line is the hook it is barbless and in place of the barb the hook is filed long and tapering to a point as sharp as that of a needle these hooks are only a few inches apart and when several thousand of them are suspended just above the bottom like a fringe for a couple of hundred fathoms they present a formidable obstacle to the fish that travel along the bottom such a fish is the sturgeon which goes rooting along like a pig and indeed is often called pigfish pricked by the first hook it touches the sturgeon gives a startled leap and comes into contact with half a dozen more hooks then it threshes about wildly until it receives hook after hook in its soft flesh and the hooks straining from many different angles hold the luckless fish fast until it is drowned because no sturgeon can pass through a chinese line the device is called a trap in the fish laws and because it bids fair to exterminate the sturgeon it is branded by the fish laws as illegal and such a line we were confident big alec intended on setting in open and flagrant violation of the law several days passed after the visit of big alec during which charlie and i kept a sharp watch on him he towed his ark around the solano wharf and into the big bight at turner's shipyard the bight we knew to be good ground for sturgeon and there we felt sure the king of the greeks intended to begin operations the tide circled like a mill race in and out of this bight and made it possible to raise lower or set a chinese line only at slack water so between the tides charlie and i made it a point for one or the other of us to keep a lookout from the solano wharf on the fourth day i was lying in the sun behind the stringer piece of the wharf when i saw a skiff leave the distant shore and pull out into the bight in an instant the glasses were at my eyes and i was following every movement of the skiff there were two men in it and though it was a good mile away i made out one of them to be big alec and ere the skiff returned to the shore i made out enough more to know that the greek had set his line big alec has a chinese line out in the bight off turner's shipyard charlie legrant said that afternoon to carmentel a fleeting expression of annoyance passed over the patrolman's face and then he said yes in an absent way and that was all charlie bit his lip with suppressed anger and turned on his heel are you game my lad he said to me later on in the evening just as we finished washing down the reindeer's decks and were preparing to turn in a lump came up in my throat and i could only nod my head well then and charlie's eyes glittered in a determined way we've got to capture big alec between us you and i and we've got to do it in spite of carmentel will you lend a hand it's a hard proposition but we can do it he added after a pause of course we can i supplemented enthusiastically and then he said of course we can and we shook hands on it and went to bed but it was no easy task we had set ourselves in order to convict a man of illegal fishing it was necessary to catch him in the act with all the evidence of the crime about him the hooks the lines the fish and the man himself this meant that we must take big alec on the open water where he could see us coming and prepare for us one of the warm receptions for which he was noted there's no getting around it charlie said one morning if we can only get alongside it's an even toss and there's nothing left for us but to try and get alongside come on lad we were in the columbia river salmon boat the one we had used against the chinese shrimp catchers slack water had come and as we dropped around the end of the solano wharf we saw big alec at work running his line and removing the fish change places charlie commanded and steer just astern of him as though you're going into the shipyard i took the tiller and charlie sat down on a thwart amidships placing his revolver handily beside him if he begins to shoot he cautioned get down in the bottom and steer from there so that nothing more than your hand will be exposed i nodded and we kept silent after that the boat slipping gently through the water and big alec growing nearer and nearer we could see him quite plainly gaffing the sturgeon and throwing them into the boat while his companion ran the line and cleared the hooks as he dropped them back into the water 
nevertheless we were five hundred yards away when the big fisherman hailed us here you what do you want he shouted keep going charlie whispered just as though you didn't hear him the next few moments were very anxious ones the fisherman was studying us sharply while we were gliding up on him every second you keep off if you know what's good for you he called out suddenly as though he had made up his mind as to who and what we were if you don't i'll fix you he brought a rifle to his shoulder and trained it on me now will you keep off he demanded i could hear charlie groan with disappointment keep off he whispered it's all up for this time i put up the tiller and eased the sheet and the salmon boat ran off five or six points big alec watched us till we were out of range when he returned to his work you'd better leave big alec alone carmen till said rather sourly to charlie that night so he's been complaining to you has he charlie said significantly carmen till flushed painfully you'd better leave him alone i tell you he repeated he's a dangerous man and it won't pay to fool with him yes charlie answered softly i've heard that it pays better to leave him alone this was a direct thrust at carmentel and we could see by the expression of his face that it sank home for it was common knowledge that big alec was as willing to bribe as to fight and that of late years more than one patrolman had handled the fisherman's money do you mean to say carmentel began in a bullying tone but charlie cut him off shortly i mean to say nothing he said you heard what i said and if the cap fits why he shrugged his shoulders and carmen told glowered at him speechless what we want is imagination charlie said to me one day when we had attempted to creep upon big alec in the gray of dawn and had been shot at for our trouble and thereafter and for many days i cudgelled my brains trying to imagine some possible way by which two men in an open stretch of water could capture another who knew how to use a rifle and was never to be found without one regularly every slack water without slyness boldly and openly in the broad day big alec was to be seen running his line and what made it particularly exasperating was the fact that every fisherman from benicia to vallejo knew that he was successfully defying us carmentel also bothered us for he kept us busy among the shad fishers of san pablo so that we had little time to spare on the king of the greeks but charlie's wife and children lived at benicia and we had made the place our headquarters so that we always returned to it i'll tell you what we can do i said after several fruitless weeks had passed we can wait some slack water till big alec has run his line and gone ashore with the fish and then we can go out and capture the line it will put him to time and expense to make another and then we'll figure to capture that too if we can't capture him we can discourage him you see charlie saw and said it wasn't a bad idea we watched our chance in the next low water slack after big alec had removed the fish from the line and returned to shore we went out in the salmon boat we had the bearings of the line from shore marks and we knew we would have no difficulty in locating it the first of the flood tide was setting in when we ran below where we thought the line was stretched and dropped over a fishing boat anchor keeping a short rope to the anchor so that it barely touched the bottom we dragged it slowly along until it struck and the boat fetched up hard and fast we've got it charlie cried come on and lend a hand to get it in together we hove up the rope till the anchor came in sight with the sturgeon line caught across one of the flukes scores of the murderous looking hooks flashed into sight as we cleared the anchor and we had just started to run along the line to the end where we could begin to lift it when a sharp thud in the boat startled us we looked about but saw nothing and returned to our work an instant later there was a similar sharp thud and the gunwale splintered between charlie's body and mine that's remarkably like a bullet lad he said reflectively and it's a long shot big alec's making and he's using smokeless powder he concluded after an examination of the mile distant shore that's why we can't hear the report i looked at the shore but could see no sign of big alec who was undoubtedly hidden in some rocky nook with us at his mercy a third bullet struck the water glanced past singing over our heads and struck the water again beyond i guess we'd better get out of this charlie remarked coolly what do you think lad 
I thought so, too, and said we didn't want the line anyway, whereupon we cast off and hoisted the spritsail. The bullets ceased at once, and we sailed away, unpleasantly confident that Big Alec was laughing at our discomfiture. And more than that, the next day on the fishing wharf, where we were inspecting nets, he saw fit to laugh and sneer at us, and this before all the fishermen. Charlie's face went black with anger, but beyond promising Big Alec that in the end he would surely land him behind the bars, he controlled himself and said nothing. The king of the Greeks made his boast that no fish patrol had ever taken him or ever could take him, and the fishermen cheered him and said it was true. They grew excited and it looked like trouble for a while, but Big Alec asserted his kingship and quelled them. Carmentil also laughed at Charlie and dropped sarcastic remarks and made it hard for him. But Charlie refused to be angered, though he told me in confidence that he intended to capture Big Alec if it took all the rest of his life to accomplish it. "'I don't know how I'll do it,' he said. "'But do it I will, as sure as I am Charlie Legrant. The idea will come to me at the right and proper time, never fear.' And at the right time it came, and most unexpectedly. Fully a month had passed, and we were constantly up and down the river, and up and down the bay, with no spare moments to devote to the particular fisherman who ran a Chinese line in the bight of Turner's shipyard. We had called in at Selby's smelter one afternoon, while on patrol work, when all unknown to us our opportunity happened along. It appeared in the guise of a helpless yacht loaded with seasick people, so we could hardly be expected to recognize it as the opportunity. It was a large sloop yacht, and it was helpless inasmuch as the trade wind was blowing half a gale and there were no capable sailors aboard. From the wharf at Selby's we watched with careless interest the lubberly manoeuvre performed of bringing the yacht to anchor, and the equally lubberly manoeuvre of sending the small boat ashore. A very miserable-looking man in draggled ducks, after nearly swamping the boat in the heavy seas, passed us the painter and climbed out. He staggered about as though the wharf were rolling, and told us his troubles, which were the troubles of the yacht. The only rough-weather sailor aboard— the man on whom they all depended had been called back to San Francisco by a telegram, and they had attempted to continue the cruise alone. The high wind and big seas of San Pablo Bay had been too much for them. All hands were sick. Nobody knew anything or could do anything, and so they had run into the smelter either to desert the yacht or to get somebody to bring it to Benicia. In short, did we know of any sailors who would bring the yacht to Benicia? Charlie looked at me. The reindeer was lying in a snug place. We had nothing on hand in the way of patrol work till midnight. With the wind then blowing, we could sail the yacht into Benicia in a couple of hours, have several more hours ashore, and come back to the smelter on the evening train. All right, Captain, Charlie said to the disconsolate yachtsman, who smiled in sickly fashion at the title. I'm only the owner, he explained. We rowed him aboard in much better style than he had come ashore, and saw for ourselves the helplessness of the passengers. There were a dozen men and women, all of them too sick even to appear grateful at our coming. The yacht was rolling savagely, brought on, and no sooner had the owner's feet touched the deck than he collapsed and joined the others. No one was able to bear a hand, so Charlie and I between us cleared the badly tangled running gear, got up sail, and hoisted anchor. It was a rough trip, though a swift one. The Carcanez Straits were a welter of foam and smother, and we came through them wildly before the wind, the big mainsail alternately dipping and flinging its boom skyward as we tore along. But the people did not mind. They did not mind anything. Two or three, including the owner, sprawled in the cockpit, shuddering when the yacht lifted and raced and sank dizzily into the trough, and between whiles regarding the shore with yearning eyes. The rest were huddled on the cabin floor among the cushions. Now and again someone groaned, but for the most part they were as limp as so many dead persons. As the bite at Turner's shipyard opened out, Charlie edged into it to get the smoother water. Venetia was in view, and we were bowling along over comparatively easy water when a speck of a boat danced up ahead of us, directly in our course. It was low-water slack. Charlie and I looked at each other. 
no word was spoken but at once the yacht began a most astonishing performance veering and yawing as though the greenest of amateurs was at the wheel it was a sight for sailormen to see to all appearances a runaway yacht was careering madly over the bight and now and again yielding a little bit to control in a desperate effort to make venetia the owner forgot his seasickness long enough to look anxious the speck of a boat grew larger and larger till we could see big alec and his partner with a turn of the sturgeon line around a cleat resting from their labor to laugh at us charlie pulled his sou'wester over his eyes and i followed his example though i could not guess the idea he evidently had in mind and intended to carry into execution we came foaming down abreast of the skiff so close that we could hear above the wind the voices of big alec and his mate as they shouted us with all the scorn that professional watermen feel for amateurs especially when amateurs are making fools of themselves we thundered on past the fishermen and nothing had happened charlie grinned at the disappointment he saw in my face then shouted stand by the main sheet to jibe he put the wheel hard over and the yacht whirled around obediently the main sheet slacked and dipped then shot over our heads after the boom and tautened with a crash on the traveller the yacht heeled over almost on her beam ends, and a great wail went up from the seasick passengers as they swept across the cabin floor in a tangled mass and piled into a heap in the starboard bunks. But we had no time for them. The yacht, completing the maneuver, headed into the wind with slatting canvas and righted to an even keel. We were still plunging ahead, and directly in our path was the skiff. I saw Big Alec dive overboard, and his mate leap for our bowsprit then came the crash as we struck the boat and a series of grinding bumps as it passed under our bottom that fixes his rifle i heard charlie mutter as he sprang upon the deck to look for big alec somewhere astern the wind and sea quickly stopped our forward movement and we began to drift backward over the spot where the skiff had been big alec's black head and swarthy face popped up within arm's reach and all unsuspecting and very angry with what he took to be the clumsiness of amateur sailors he was hauled aboard also he was out of breath for he had dived deep and stayed down long to escape our keel the next instant to the perplexity and consternation of the owner charlie was on top of big alec in the cockpit and i was helping bind him with gaskets the owner was dancing excitedly about and demanding an explanation but by that time big alec's partner had crawled aft from the bowsprit and was peering apprehensively over the rail into the cockpit charlie's arm shot around his neck and the man landed on his back beside big alec more gaskets charlie shouted and i made haste to supply them the wrecked skiff was rolling sluggishly a short distance to windward and i trimmed the sheets while charlie took the wheel and steered for it these two men are old offenders he explained to the angry owner and they are most persistent violators of the fish and game laws you have seen them caught in the act and you may expect to be subpoenaed as witness for the state when the trial comes off as he spoke he rounded alongside the skiff it had been torn from the line a section of which was dragging to it he hauled in forty or fifty feet with a young sturgeon still fast in a tangle of barbless hooks slashed that much of the line free with his knife and tossed it into the cockpit beside the prisoners and there's the evidence exhibit a for the people charlie continued look it over carefully so that you may identify it in the courtroom with the time and place of capture and then in triumph with no more veering and yawing we sailed into benicia the king of the greeks bound hard and fast in the cockpit and for the first time in his life a prisoner of the fish patrol End of section two. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com.